so far we've understood that this DNA was discovered, the molecule of heredity DNA was discovered and the story goes way back to Mendel when Mendel was basically successful in identifying uh, something of a particular nature that was responsible in transmission of genetic information from one generation to the next which he called the factor. Later on Frederick Maischer was able to isolate this particular component that was present inside the nucleus called nuclein which was basically the DNA he was able to chemically isolate it. Further theories came up which proposed that chromosomes are the, uh, are, the, are the substances are basically the contents present inside the nucleus that carries that carry information from one generation to the next. Now similarly we yesterday in our session we understood we basically looked at three brilliant experiments uh, conducted by different individuals we understood what the transforming principle was as uh, was uh, discovered by Griffith and eventually that transforming principle was elucidated or found out to be DNA and not any other molecule so since uh, up till yesterday we understood that DNA is the genetic material now experimentation experimentations kept on continuing even after the discovery of DNA as the genetic material. Now there are these two notable experiments that we are going to look today into which led to the discovery of the model of the DNA. Alright, so DNA is responsible, it is the carrier of heredity, but what does this molecule look like? And that was the next quest. And that quest was sorted out, was solved by two individuals, Francis and Craig, which we will come to in just a little while. But their work, their proposal was based on two major experiments. And let us have a look at those two major experiments. Now, these group, these individuals out here on the, on the slide that you see now are the ones that we're going to discuss. So here, this individual is Erwin Chargaff, and he was a biochemist, and he made certain major contributions to the elucidation of the structure of DNA. Likewise, we also have in the other image two brilliant scientists, Morris Wilkins, who was a biophysicist, and Rosalind Franklin here, who was a chemist and an X-ray crystallographer. Basically, uh, she was an expert in taking X-ray images of molecules. So first of all, let us look at Erwin Chargaff and his contribution. Now, Erwin Chargaff was a biochemist and he started analyzing the DNA for its components. So he started doing analysis, quantitative analysis of the components of DNA. And if you remember the components of DNA, we've got the sugar, which is deoxyribose, we've got nitrogenous bases, and we've got the phosphates. These are the three important major components. Now, he was more interested in the nitrogenous bases. So he started quantitative analysis of these nitrogenous bases. When I say quantitative analysis, what I mean to say is he, he started finding out that the DNA of a certain organism, for example, Drosophila or the fruit fly contained Drosophila, the Drosophila contained how much of adenine, how much of guanine, how much of cytosine and how much of thymine. So these are the th four nitrogenous bases and he was more interested in finding out what was the amount of each of these nitrogenous bases in the DNA. So not only he worked on Drosophila, he worked on the DNA of many, many, many different organisms. And at the end of his study, he reached a certain conclusion. And that is the conclusion that we are going to study now. And this conclusion, these, these certain conclusions that he came out with are today known as Chargaff's rules. So what he figured out was that the total number of pyrimidines, the thymine and the cytosine, I hope you remember what pyrimidines are. Pyrimidines are the monocyclic nitrogenous bases. There are three of them. And sim similarly, we've got purines, which are bicyclic uh, nitrogenous bases present in, the, uh, present in the DNA. So now, let us have a look at the Chargaff's rule. But before we get into Chargaff's rule, let us draw a fictitious uh, uh, strand of DNA. A complementary strand of DNA. So let us just randomly make one A, T and let's not draw a bonding between them. Let's just write them side by side. It's just a random sequence A, A, T, G, C, C, G, A, T. And now the complementary pair would be adenine pairs up with thymine, thymine, 
guanine with cytosine cytosine pairs up with guanine cytosine pairs with guanine here it's a cytosine adenine pairs with thymine and thymine pairs with adenine certainly the number of bonds between them is also something that we should remember so adenine and thymine are bound, uh, are bound to each other by a double bond two hydrogen bonds thymine to adenine a double bond guanine and cytosine are bound to each other via three triple three three bonds three hydrogen bonds or a triple bond so basically we have got these three hydrogen bonds here three hydrogen bonds here two hydrogen bonds here two hydrogen bonds here so what we have here is a small tiny little segment of dna and why why have we drawn this is just to understand the chargaff's rule so chargaff analyzed a large sample of or in wide varieties of dna samples from different organisms and the quantitative analysis led him to uh, led him uh, to conclude that the total amount of pyrimidine is always equal to total amount of purine present in a dna now i have just uh, written all of this sequence uh, without putting any uh, head to it uh, other than the logic that adenine pairs with thymine and guanine always pairs up with cytosine and vice versa so let us just look at the total number of pyrimidine molecules out here and pyrimidine is thymine and cytosine right so let us count thymine and cytosine and underline them with a blue marker so that we can count them so let us see thymine one two and then we got three here four and then five so we got five thymines here and number of cytosines how many cytosines do we have we got like one two three and four and we got like four cytosines here plus four all right so let us just cross check once again so how many thymines one two three four five thymines and cytosines one two three and four right no more and let us see if it equals the total amount of purine present in this particular small tiny little segment so the purines are adenine and guanine so let us count the number of adenines here and let us use a, a, a yellow marker so here we got one adenine one and two and three and four and five so we got like five adenines right one two three four and five so we got five adenines here and how many guanines do we have let us count mm, one and two and three and four you know four guanines and does this hold true so five plus four is nine total number of pyrimidines in our fictitious segment that we just took is basically nine and how many purines do we have nine so this is one this was one of the conclusions that chargaff came out after analyzing like hundreds and hundreds of different samples from like tens or twenties or thirties or forties of different types of organisms right so this turned out to be one of the rules no matter what kind of dna you pick up you will always find this as a rule the number total number of pyrimidines is always equal to total number of purine nitrogen spaces present in a dna segment now the second point of chagas rule was the adenine is equal to thymine right so what do we have adenine the number of adenines present in a DNA segment is equal to total number of thiamines present. It is pretty much rational because an adenine can only bind to a thiamine, can uh, bind to thiamine via hydrogen bonds, right? So let us just see here how many adenines do we have here? And uh, for this study, let us use uh, 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 let's use a green marker, right? So let us count the number of adenines here. So we got like one adenine, two and here we got three and four and like five so we got like five adenines right and do we have the same number of thymines obviously because that is the complementary base of adenine so anyways let us still count one and you got two and three and we got four and we got five so this is also a rule the number of adenines is equal to number of thymines and likewise the number of guanines in a DNA sequence is equal to the number of cytosine bases in a DNA molecule. So this was the second rule of Chargaff's. And the third rule is the sum total of adenine and thiamine. If we are saying the sum total of the AT, A plus T is not necessarily equal to GC, guanine plus cytosine. So what is AT? AT is a base pair. Adenine and thiamine is a base pair. Adenine, thiamine base pair is not necessarily it may be but it usually is not necessarily equal to the uh, number of base pairs guanine and cytosine uh, so and this is called the atgc ratio 
and different organisms have different ATGC ratios. The GC ratio of humans will be different from the ATGC ratio of, let us say, a house fly, right? So, why is this important is something that is used greatly in molecular biology and in genetics, ATGC ratio. Anyways, let's proceed a little back and do a little bit of math here and see, does this third rule also apply here? The number of adenine and thymine, so how many 80s we have? So we got like 180 here, two, and we got the third 80 here, and let's say we got the fourth 80 pair here, and fifth, so we got like five 80s, and how many GCs do we have? So we got like one, and two, and three, and four. So the ratio of 80 and GC here is five is to four, five is to four, which is, basically the third rule of Chargaff. So this, these were the major findings of Erwin Chargaff, which he concluded after the quantitative analysis of the nitrogenous bases in DNAs of large number of different organisms. And it took him a large, huge amount of time. So that was his major contribution. And these are called the Chargaff's rule. Now we look at the second experiment and the outcome of that experiment. The second experiment was conducted by Morris Wilkins, who was a biophysicist, and Rosalind Franklin, who was a chemist and an X-ray crystallographer. Now, what these two individuals did, they were successful in taking the first X-ray image of the DNA. So what do you see here in the center here? This is the first image of the DNA. Now, if to a, to a naive eye, to an eye like mine, this would absolutely make no sense. It looks like an X with tiny little dots around, moving in a crossing fashion, and you got something really dense out here and something dense out here. But to these individuals who were a master of their own art, who were uh, basically uh, well versed in their own subjects, could actually figure out something about DNA and the points that they could figure about DNA was not only these two individuals, but again, uh, Francis and Crick. Francis and Crick. These two individuals got the Nobel Prize for proposing the model of the DNA as we know it today. Right, so both of these individuals, Francis and Crick, uh, along with the works of these gentlemen were able to, particularly this X-ray uh, image, they deduced the X-ray image, they analyzed it and they could, they came out with a couple of ideas about DNA. And what was the first idea is that this is a very long molecule. See, this is only a bird's eye view of this massive long molecule. This is just one of the parts. And they could figure it out that this is basically a very long molecule. Number two, they could figure out that there, there, there are these two helices which are running parallel to each other. Basically, there are these two strands which are running parallel to each other. They could deduce it from the image. And the third outcome that they reached was that this is basically a helix. It's not a straight molecule. It's not a linear molecule. Rather, it is a helix. It is a twisted structure on itself. So these three were the elucidations uh, made by Francis and Crick from the X-ray image of the DNA. Francis and Crick also made use of the Chargaff's rules to build the model of the DNA as we know it today. So let us wait and proceed further and look at these two individuals, the Nobel laureates. Here we have got James D. Watson and this is Francis Crick. And both of them are basically can be seen along with their one of their models, the finished models of their DNA. Now, they did not conduct any experiment. And that is really amazing. They purely worked on the data provided by different individuals. They read around what was happening in the experimental field. They went deeply through the works of Erwin Chargaff and uh, Rosalind Franklin and Wilkins and maybe many other works. And eventually they came out with a model which they have now built up here in, 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 in material. And let us have a look at what their model proposes. Now, here are the four features of their proposals. Uh, you should bear in mind that they never conducted any experiment. They simply used the data provided by others, compiled it in a uh, uh, extremely logically, brilliantly, and simply came out with a model which stood the test of time which and, and is known to us as we know it. Right, so let us look at the features of this model. Now, the first point was that 
DNA, this particular molecule, is a double helix. Now here is a double helix. Let us try to understand what a helix is. So basically here in the center, image B is of a DNA, which is basically a ladder-like structure. So this is these are the two backbones, the phosphate sugar backbones, and in the center we've got the nitrogenous base pairs, right? Now, DNA is found as a helix, which means this ladder is not just two-dimensional structure. It is basically twisted. It is twisted and we get a molecule like this. So this curled twisted molecule is called a helix and they call it a double helix. So the first point was that DNA is a double helix. And the second point they came out with was that both the strands, this particular strand and this particular strand, both these strands are bound to each other through hydrogen bonds and this these are the hydrogen bonds present in the center and what are the hydrogen bonds between the hydrogen bonds are between nitrogenous bases so adenine and thymine are bound to each other are bounded are bound to each other through two bonds two hydrogen bonds and likewise a cytosine and a guanine are bound to each other via triple bond so the two strands or the two backbones and the two strands basically are bound to each other in the center through hydrogen bonds that was also one of the postulates and adenine always binds to thiamine and cytosine is always bound to guanine the next and, and if you see what is this point of deduction from this is a deduction of the x-ray image let's go back a little and look at the x-ray image can you see these two darker bands on the edges these edge these bands on the edges these darker bands are basically the backbone the sugar phosphate backbones and in the center this x is seen because it's the twist this this is what gave them the hint that this basically is not a straight molecule rather a twist rather a helical molecule the second feature of this molecule of dna was that most of the dna helix are right-handed structures now, let me just bring to your notice that there are different varieties of DNA also. So the most common form of DNA that we study and that is found in most of the organism is called the B DNA. And so even this one is the B, B form of DNA. Likewise, we also have something called as the A DNA and also the Z DNA. Right now, we are more interested in understanding more about the B DNA. So they said that most of the DNA helices are right-handed. What do we mean by right-handed? Now, if you move your right hand to the front in such a way that your thumb is pointing towards the ceiling, is pointing upwards, look at the orientation of your finger, the direction of your fingers. If you're right, if you move your right hand to the front and move your thumb upwards, the direction of your fingers is towards your wrist. And if you see this, if you twist your wrist, you can see a right-handed turn. This is called a right-handed turn. Now use your hand and look at the image on your screen and you can see the twist is right-handed it's coiled in uh, the direction of the fingers of the right hand of your right hand right so this is called the right-handed helix so the b dna which they were working on or the dna that they were working on they were able to successfully guess that it's a right-handed structure and later on experimentally it was verified to be so the next point or the feature of their model of DNA was that the this this particular helix the double helix of DNA is an anti-parallel molecule it's an anti-parallel molecule what do we mean by anti-parallel molecule it is also anti it is also anti it is also opposite and it is also parallel so let us have a look at this strand opened up and let us look at the molecular structure here rather than simply having uh, to look at these particular models let's look at the molecular structure here and what do we see here we see the two strands here so one is this strand and the other is this strand so both of these strands are parallel okay and uh, what part do we call a strand let us simply dissect this molecule into two equal halves let's pass a fictitious line from the center so what do we see we see one half here and we see one half here so this is this this particular one half here is called one of the strands and this is the other strand and if you look at both the strands they are parallel to each other but they are not just parallel to each other they are also opposite to each other we do not mean that this is opposite to this but the orientation of molecules is opposite let us look a little deeper to understand what do we mean by that now let us look at one of the ends here so this end of let, let's just call it the right strand and let's call it this the left strand or, or let's do conventionally let's call this the right this is the right this is the left strand 
there's only let's call this the left strand and then let's call this part the right strand so this is the right strand this is the left strand and looking at the right strand let us look at the top of this here what do we see we see the five prime end of the molecule what is the five prime end of the molecule the five prime end of the molecule is the five end of the sugar the deoxyribose sugar so this is the fifth carbon of deoxyribose sugar which is bound to the phosphate and this is one of the free ends even though in reality there is no such free end but for the sake of convention we take it so if you break a dna strand you will find this so we have one five prime end and if you go exactly to the opposite end which end would be free we'll have a three third carbon of the uh, deoxyribose sugar would be free would be available for binding so if you look at this strand this is a five prime three prime strand and if you look at the other strand what is the direction of that five prime three prime it is exactly the opposite so the direction of orientation of molecules is anti to each other is opposite to each other and that's why dna is known as an anti parallel a molecule with anti-parallel strands so there are two parallel strands which are anti to each other uh, with respect to the orientation of their three prime five prime ends so it's an anti-parallel uh, molecule the strands are anti-parallel in this particular molecule now let us look at the next uh, feature of the of the model that they proposed which is that the outer edges of the nitrogenous bases so where are the nitrogenous bases these are the nitrogenous bases they are found in the center of the molecule but if you if you twist it so now this is all twisted right if you twist it it's like a twisted ladder there are surfaces and let us have a look at the surfaces so you see we have a little surface here and we have a little surface here we have a little surface here we have a little surface here and so the central part basically these surfaces are exposed to the environment around them see the ends of the nitrogenous bases are not exposed because they are bound so these are the nitrogenous bases the ends are bound it's bound to the sugar the other end is uh, involved in hydrogen bonding this particular end is again bound to the sugar and this particular end of this nitrogenous base is involved in hydrogen bonding but if you look at the unexposed parts if you look at the edges of these nitrogenous bases. now where are the edges of the nitrogenous bases? let us look at this so for example this nitrogen here is one of the edges if you look at this particular part this is one uh, and if you, if you look at this particular oxygen so there are these different parts which are still exposed which are not involved in any kind of bonding right so there are these parts these are called the outer edges of nitrogenous bases now these particular areas also provide surface for hydrogen bonding which means that they have they, these particular areas are uh, may have a certain possibility to interact with molecules uh, let us say for example water or let us say some um, some kind of amino acids so they have this ability to form hydrogen bonds with water or with amino acids now what is the significance of this particular these outer edges of nitrogenous being a uh, nitrogenous bases uh, being uh, uh, you know uh, potential uh, sources or areas for hydrogen bonding the significance is that the DNA molecule is constantly interacting with proteins is constantly interacting with protein molecules uh, particularly enzymes right so I hope from one of your previous classes you know about histone proteins so histone proteins cannot interact with this DNA molecule and fold it up without interacting with these surfaces so this is one of the uh, good examples that we can use at the moment there are many many other examples wide other variety of proteins interact with the dna uh, molecule for example the polymerases or gyrases or helicases there are these different types of enzymes that do bind and interact with the molecule so these were the four major features that were proposed by francis and crick and what was really amazing is that they had conducted no experiment rather it was purely based on deduction based on their uh, intellectual uh, reflection on the previous experimental works of the two uh, great groups of scientists uh, uh, which we've just dealt a little while ago now not only this was the proposal of francis and crick they also now made another very uh, very outgoing uh, 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 they made this proclamation about the way in which dna replicates so they made a proclamation about dna replication now dna replication is extremely important to entire life for us its importance lies in 
uh, the continuation of life, right? So now one cell, when it divides into two, whether through meiosis or mitosis, DNA must be doubled. And not only DNA must be doubled, it must be doubled uh, faithfully. Here is the word faithfully. It must be doubled up in a way so that there is no loss of any particular base because if a particular base is lost, if there is a mistake or loss of a couple of bases, the entire sequence will change. If the sequence changes, there will be a change in the genes. If the genes are changed, then there is a change in the phenotype or the expression or the characteristics we have. Now those characteristics can be deleterious, can be harmful, can cause diseases. Uh, they may also be beneficial. but uh, what the cellular machinery does, it always uh, insists, it always is continuously working out for a faithful replication of DNA. Now, during the times of Francis and Crick, there were these theoretical ideas and theoretical models about how the DNA replicates. Now, the idea that Francis and Crick uh, proposed was that DNA, this particular molecule, it uh, replicates semi-conservatively semi-conservatively so they propose the semi-conservative mode of replication now what is this semi-conservative mode of replication we'll take another five minutes on this particular session and understand the three different models that were proposed during those times so the three models that were uh, basically out in the market you know trying to make their point and uh, trying to get dominance out there were the semi-conservative mode of replication number one we also had something called as the conservative mode of replication and the third we have the dispersive mode of replication now what was the semi-conservative mode of replication according to the semi-conservative mode of replication the two complementary strands see both the strands are complementary what do we mean by that so let us say we got like a t g c g g t a if you got this particular strand and the opposite strand what what should we have i think let, let's just build this we have got t a c g c c a t right so this is the complementary strand let us say this is the original strand if we are able to break the bonds in between we can use each of them to generate two more strands right so let us say this is the dna of the parent and what the semi-conservative mode of replication proposes proposed at that time was that these two single strands if they are separated out let us just separate them out let us take the lower strand t a c g c c a t let us just take this strand let us build let us also separate the other strand the upper strand let us say we've somehow separated them the two strands have been split apart a t g c g g t a now both these strands can act as templates to build two more new strands so let us say if the cell provides each of these strands with nitrogenous bases then a complementary strand can be generated. See, thiamine will always bind with adenine. It cannot bind with another thiamine, another cytosine or guanine. It cannot because that is a faulty binding, right? Uh, because the DNA strand is complementary. So let us just generate the complementary strands here. So what will be generated here? We get A, we get T, we get G, we get C, G, G, T, A. So one of the strands is developed here and the other strand will be a T T A G C C G G C C A and we have a T and our, so these are two new daughter strands and you see both the strands are actually nothing more but a copy of the original parent strand let's have a look A T G C so we got A T G C here and G G T A G G T A and let's have the next strand so we got A T G C right A T G C and G G T A G G T A so this is called the semi-conservative mode of replication semi means half conservative means preserved conservative is preserved so watson and crick based on the model that they proposed based on their study of wide variety of data also eventually proclaimed that the mode of replication of dna is semi-conservative which means half of the strand is preserved half of the parental strand is preserved this is the parent strand so half of this is preserved I'm, I'm so sorry so half of this strand is preserved half of this strand is preserved and 
two new strands are synthesized. This is called the semi-conservative mode of replication and let us have a look at this diagram. So you see these are the two strands, they spread out, they open up and the dark pink is the parent strand and on top of the parent strand, a new complementary lighter pink strand is generated or developed and that is how DNA molecule is replicated. Now during the same time also there was another idea which is called the con which was known as the conservative mode of DNA replication. It still is known as conservative mode of DNA replication. And according to this mode of replication, there is no opening up or splitting up of the strand. But through certain mechanisms in the cells, this particular strand gives rise to an exact replica, exact duplicate of its own self. How it does it was unknown, but this was one of the models. Anyways, today we know that there is no such way there is nothing like a conservative mode of replication it is just a theory which has now been knocked out so this has been knocked out so we don't we know that this does just this mode of replication just does not exist anyways also there was another theory proposed at that time which was known as the dispersive mode of replication according to which this particular strand the parental strand of dna breaks up first of all it breaks up into segments of different lengths and then you see, so now we've broken this into different lengths. So let's say this part here is here, this part here is here, and this part here is here. So dispersive is uh, basically scattered. So the strand first of all breaks into tiny little parts and then each part will generate between the two ends or three ends or four ends between these ends, they will make a new copy, right? So for example, these two ends, when they broke up, they replaced, they made a copy in here in between them to make another copy and this strand that broke off made two copies on two either sides to make exact replicas but also today we know that this was only a theory it actually just does not happen anywhere and this theory was also knocked out and today by today we know that the semi-conservative mode of replication is how actually dna replicates but this was just a proposal right so far what Francis and Crick, what these two individuals did was brilliantly took all the data, came out with all the features, proposed it and left it for the rest of the world to ponder on it, to experiment on it and to say, well, you're wrong. Uh, but it turns out that whatever experiments were conducted on these particular features that they proposed and even on semi-conservative mode of replication turned out to be true. In our next session, we will look at the experimental method we will look at the Meselson and Stahl's experiment now these two individuals he's Meselson and he's Stahl both of these individuals they designed a wonderful experiment a beautiful experiment with the help of which they actually could prove that the mode of replication was semi-conservative mode of replication but this is what we will see in our next session so thank you for now